us, and it's good to be in God's house to study His Word and to be nourished, nourished, I trust, organically. Now, organic is an interesting word that has a different meaning to different people. And Brother Alex was asking me while we were sitting there, uh, is, is an organic Christian something like a label? Just a label that you have? Or is it something more than that? And um, I trust and pray that as we will look at this subject today, we will get a new understanding of this spiritual application that is made. The scripture text tells us that God is glorified if we bear much fruit. So we are here for fruit bearing, for bearing fruit. Is our fruit organic or inorganic? What kind of fruit are we bearing? What do our fruits look like? You know, this word organic is used so much, and we see it in the food uh, areas of the stores. Things are labeled, and, and uh, that means something. And according to the definition of organic, here's uh, the definition. It's kind of a farming method. It involves a production of Foods without the use of chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, other artificial agents. So that's kind of the definition of organic food. Now we're going to take this definition and kind of morph it a little bit and make a spiritual application uh, to help us understand that I believe there is such a thing as an organic Christian with a modified definition of the word organic, not this literal definition. And we see these labels, right? If, if, we, if we want to buy organic foods, we look for these kinds of labels. They're so popular nowadays uh, with certain meaning. And if we buy plants, I know in the springtime when we want to plant things in the garden, we even go so far as to maybe go to O'Toole's just down the street here, on uh, Bellevue, just a little bit off of Bellevue there, and we want to buy organic plants so that we can have organic foods because organic plants, they are non-GMO. See, they're certified, non-GMO certified. So we can get these uh, this organic food. And, and you know, we, we see these things, see, organic food versus GMO food versus non-GMO foods, and we have different images that come into our mind. I don't know what you think about when you think about organic or non-organic, but these may be some things that come into your mind. You think of spraying, of, of uh, hormones, of uh, antibiotics, of all kinds of things. I don't know what visions you have that come into your mind. Maybe you're looking at this, a hypodermic needle sticking into a tomato plant, making a little smaller tomato plant all of a sudden, a GMO tomato plant, or, or tomato that's going to be better, look better, taste better, transport better, uh, last longer. And it's a big thing in society. You know, this, this subject was something almost nobody talked about. Now, in conversation, it's amazing how many people really get into this and take this very, very seriously and are very, very... Uh, uh, opinionated, very opinionated on this subject. And many people are very concerned, and they're concerned for reasons like this. This is the U.S. Uh, statistical acreage for GMO types of foods. Look at the percent of acreage. This is about two years old, this, this bar graph here. So of all of the cotton that's planted in the United States, 96% of it is, in acreage, is under GMO practices. Look at, uh, here we got sugar beets, 95%, soybeans, 94%, corn, 93%, canola oil, canola oil, 90%, and even the papaya, the papaya, 50% of the acreage is, is uh, GMO uh, produced, alfalfa. And then we have summer squash, a little bit less there at 12%. But we see that there's a large amount of uh, produce that is non-organic. So when we see this organic label, this means something special to people. 
This means that it's not this, but something else. Something, something so much better. So, we read in Matthew 7. Taking now a spiritual definition for organic, not the literal one, and understanding it in a little bit of a context that I think will be uh, uh, more expressive in our minds and hearts of what this really means and what the world is that we're living in. What is the world that we're living in? We read here in Matthew 7. And ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes? Thorns, figs, and thistles. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So the Bible tells us there is such a thing as good fruit and not good fruit. And it tells us that by the fruit, by looking at the fruit, we can know what it is. So my question is, what kind of fruit are you bearing? What kind of fruit am I bearing? Or do we even have fruit? Remember the barren fig tree? God came and looked at the fig tree, Christ, and what did he see? Only leaves. There were no fruits. This, by the way, happens to be my wife's favorite fruit. Not mine so much. But, but this fruit here is the fig. This is the fig. Are there figs? Are we a fruitful, fruit-bearing vine or tree? Ye have not chosen me, says the Bible in John 15, 16. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So God wants us to be fruit-bearing, right? Bring forth fruit, not just have leaves. A life of quiet, quiet, prayerful meditation is not all that Jesus expects of us. He expects what does it say? Fruit. Exemplifying in our lives the virtues of true godliness. So if we are a vine, do we have rich clusters of grapes? Is our life fruitful? Is your life fruitful? Is my life fruitful? And what fruit am I bearing? Because what does the Bible say? By their fruits you will Know them. Christ's object lesson. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. And he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. What is the object of the Christian life? Fruit bearing. The reproduction of Christ's character in the believer, that it may be reproduced in others. So the purpose of the Christian life is what? Fruit bearing. Fruit bearing. And what are the fruits that should be born in our lives? What should be reproduced? Christ's character. Christ's character are the fruits we should bear in our lives. Are we a fruit-laden tree that people who know us and come in contact with our lives can pick from the rich fruits of Christ's character? Can they find those fruits in my life? Can they find those fruits in your life? Are you an abundant fruit bearer? Now Christ tells us plainly that the whole power, the whole fruit-bearing quality is in the parent stock. Okay, so the quality and what is produced is dependent upon what? The stock, the vine, the tree on which it grows. 
Then let them be abiding in Christ and drawing the nourishment from Christ. And what shall they see? We shall see something, the world will see something. There is a clear line of distinction between the believing and the unbelieving, between those that obey God and those that disobey Him. There is a decided and marked difference in the fruits they bear. The fruit is character. So when people look at us, what kind of fruit are they seeing? Are they seeing something like everything else and everybody else? Or are they seeing something different? You believe Jesus was different. He was distinct. He was unique. He was perfect. And he looks for and he desires that we bear fruits that are a reflection of his character in our lives. And Christ does everything to make this possible. Look what he says here in out of Isaiah 5. And he fenced it and he gathered the stones thereof and he planted it with the choicest vines. And what happened? He found out later on they brought forth wild grapes. Something happened. Christ did so much. And when he went to, to look at the vineyard, the, the choicest vines were not bringing forth what do you plan to bring forth wild grapes? He says, what could have been done more in my vineyard that I have not done? Wherefore, when I looked at it, it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. You see, Christ does everything. He's done everything for us to bring forth fruit, a reflection of Jesus Christ. But there is a problem. There is a problem, and we, we can call it the human condition. The human condition is the problem, and what is that? You see, back in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were perfect. They were made in the image of God, in the likeness of God. But something happened that changed everything. You see? Genesis 2.17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. See, Adam and Eve in the beginning were perfect. They were fruitful. What did God say? The first commandment he said to Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And have dominion over all these things. And what were they? A reflection of Jesus Christ. They were made in the image of God. But they made a choice in the Garden of Eden, and they chose to listen to someone else, and I'd like to suggest to you they became GMO modified. They became GMO modified. How is that? Something took place. They were not the same anymore. Remember how beautiful they were? Everything was beautiful, perfect, a reflection of Christ. But a modification, an organism modification took place at the genetic level of their thinking and their being, and they were no longer the same. They now died. They now were naked. They now blamed each other. And they now had a problem with who they were. They became genetically modified organisms, no longer in the original organic state that God made them. Perfect. They were changed. Sin has nearly erased the image of God in human beings. Genetically modified. Erase even the way they look to bring them back to the perfection which they were first created is the great purpose of life. The whole purpose of life is to take you and me, genetically modified organisms, and make us organic again. In the original state, unadulterated by sin, not deformed, but in the likeness of God. You see, 
Genetic modification can do all kinds of things. When I went online to look at pictures of genetic modified organisms, I found all kinds of interesting pictures of how you can do things. I mean, this is a tomato, but it's not, it's not, you know what I mean? There's something different about this tomato. See, we're still, we're still human beings, God's creation. But sin has modified this organism. And you and I are no longer the same as we were when we came from the hand of the Creator. And what did we read was the purpose of life? The purpose of life. What will you think now from now on about the purpose of life? Is to put you back into the original created state. That's the whole purpose for living. I, if we could only understand that. If we could only understand why we're here. And what it's all about. I think our efforts, our energies, our goals, our perspectives. Everything about what we do, what we think, and where we go would be different. Would be different. In the beginning God created man in his own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced. All the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised. What is the plan of salvation for? Is to undo the genetic modification that took place with sin in your life and restore it back in its origins. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was first <coughs> created. That's the purpose of the plan of salvation. To make, if you will, organic people. To bring them back to the original perfect state in which it was first created. This is the object of life. You see, GMO changes things. This is an example of GMO contamination of an organic food. They've done studies, and there's various things that, that can contaminate organic and make it non-organic. And we'll look at some of these things. This is not going to be a uh, one sermon series, but we will have other studies on this. But we will just cover it today until we run out of time, and then we'll continue it on another time at another occasion. But you see here, as a result of GMO contamination, you can have this kind of corn, and depending upon the degree of GMO effect on that corn, it can start looking like this. It can start looking like this as it is affected and as it changed. Here's that text again. I looked that it should bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. The fruit Christ claims after the patient care bestowed upon his church is what? Faith, patience, love, forbearance, heavenly mindedness, meekness, these are the clusters of fruit which mature amid storm and cloud and darkness, as well as in the sunshine. This is how Adam and Eve were. They had faith, they had patience, they had forbearance, they were heavenly minded, but things changed. You see, the devil, the devil seeks to cause a progression of GMO modification and contamination as time goes on. Because the human race, as time goes on, continues to degenerate in every way and in every form. Satan is playing the game of life for every soul that is upon the earth. All who will study and obey the directions of God will have the mind of Christ. Then all passions, all dissension will be put away. There will be a cultivation of the higher faculties of the mind. Skipping down. 
Because there is so little study of the Word, there is with many scarcely any desire to know what saith the Lord. Errors have come in and usurped the place of truth. The wild branch has been grafted in and has borne wild grapes. The result has been centuries of darkness and error. Men have introduced modification, human theories, thinking as it did our first parents when tempted by Satan to eat of the tree of knowledge, that they would become as God. But these sentiments are not in harmony with the word. They are false and they're rooted in their You see, the whole GMO project was to make something better. See, GMO uh, introduced into agriculture and introduced into farming practice and introduced into food is not for bad intentions. It's for good. It is. And you know, GMO foods do a lot of things. What can they do with that? Increase productivity, feed the world, bigger, better food. Last longer, better shelf life, preserves and under transport, a lot of positive things. You see, that is what <coughs> Satan introduced to Adam and Eve. When the serpent came and said, oh, you're not going to surely die. Something better is going to happen. Your eyes are going to be open and you're going to see as gods and understand things better. You're going to have a higher state of knowledge modification of the organism took place and sin resulted in the deformity that you and I as human beings are today. We are no longer those beautiful fruit-bearing individuals that Adam and Eve were. We are deformed, degraded. We are no longer in the image of God. And as time goes on, guess what? We're not evolving into better, we are degenerating into a greater distortion under the influence of sin and Satan. We are friends in the great web of humanity and as such related to each other. Interesting statement, listen to this. Our lives leave upon the minds of others impressions which will be transferred even into eternity. Did you ever think of that? Your influence, your interaction, your relation with other people is an influence not only for this world, but for all eternity. So what influence are you generating? What are you exuding? What do the fruits look like? Because they have an eternal effect on other people. It's a sobering thought for myself. What am I doing for the eternity of others? Angels take note. Look what they take note of. What are they looking at? The fruits. The fruits, what are they looking at? Our works. Our words, the spirit that we have, this is what they're seeing. See, and what we need to, what we need to have is purity. We need to focus on being organic. Okay, if we, because organic is usually associated with pesticide free, you know, pure. What does the Bible say? Blessed are the pure. For they shall see God. You know what? No GMO is going to be in heaven. Do you believe that? No GMO is going to be in heaven. Whether it's Christian food wise or otherwise. What's going to be in heaven is what was there in the beginning. And the whole purpose of salvation and the whole purpose of life for you and me is to be again what? Restored into the image of God, back to our original state, to undo that so that we truly can have a label, non-GMO project verified. And we can have a whole other study on the sealing message 
because we're living in the sealing time. And what is the sealing? It is a label. Nobody sees that label. But God sees it and God knows. For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thy knowledge. What is our doctrine? Do we have a pure doctrine, or is our doctrine modified? Can it have the USDA organic stamp on it? Or has it been adulterated by the modification of sin and of this world? We read in Acts, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the regular friend and prayers. Are we continuing forward in the doctrine steadfast of the apostles of the word of God? Are we feeding on the organic, wholesome bread of life? Or are we eating the GMO contaminated doctrines of this world? Is that what we're feasting on? What are we feasting on? The wholesome, organic food? Oh, we say, we say, but really? Let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you. And when we look at Revelation 14, the second angel's message, which was first given in 1844, the summer, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Why? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, what alters foods and makes them non-GMO? Or makes them not organic? Pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, hormones, antibiotics, all the list is long that they have. I don't even know what's all on that list. But all these things take away that label's ability to certify it. That's what's happening in our world today. The doctrines of this world have been modified. They're no longer organic. And what is the inorganic wine and drink that has been so widely distributed to all of Babylon? The wine. What is the wine? We're going to look at that later, maybe some other time. Insight. False doctrines. Wherefore, come out from among them and be, what's the word? Separate. Separate. Why? We're going to look at that too in a minute. Say the Lord, and touch not. Why? We're going to look at that in a minute too. The unclean thing, and I will receive you. See, to be non-GMO certified, there has to be touch not the unclean man come apart. It's interesting if you go online and you start reading. I don't know very much about GMOs, but I learned a lot more by doing this study. I learned a lot more. I learned what kind of practices farmers have to go through so that the one thing doesn't touch the other thing because that, that nullifies and invalidates the label. And separation, we're going to look at that too. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, And be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath darkness with light? Do you see? <laughs> when, when, they, when they have GMO crops that are planted, there's one big concern, and that is managing pollination drift and the contamination of non-GMO plants. You see, when you plant a crop of corn, and it is a modified corn. If you want to have organic corn, what is the danger? Pollen. You see, the pollen from the GMO corn can go over and, quote unquote, contaminate the organic. And now it will be modified. So let's look at what some of these, these, these distances are and what farmers look at and how they, how they plant things. So, if you, if you are 600 feet away, GMO from non-GMO, you're going to have a 1% pollen drift. Pollen will drift 1%, 600 feet. 1.5? 984 feet. 
And if you want to get to point O of point 1, you need to have the things how far apart? 1,640 feet. Otherwise, if you don't do this, this is what happens. Okay, here we have Indian corn. This was 37.5 feet away. And you see the Indian corn is the purple. And this is the regular corn. But what you get is you get kernels. See, pollen drifts. And when pollen drifts, it brings forth fruit because it pollinates. And when it pollinates, depending on what it is, it makes more of itself. It makes more of itself. Pollen drifts. Do you know where I'm going with this? And depending on how close and how far things are, certain things can become affected. You know, the laws of science, the laws of nature, and the principles of religion are not contradictory. I believe we can learn a lot from nature in our and for our spiritual lives. Amen. Can you say amen to that one? Amen. We can learn a lot from nature for our spiritual lives. Now, so we have pollen that can carry things. What else can we have? Oh, we can have insects. What do insects do? Insects take pollen from one plant to the other, right? And as they take pollen from one plant to the other, what do they do? They mix things, right? They can mix things. Insects. Oh, I can think of a really big insect. It was called the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And that serpent took what? Error and modified the organism who was Adam and Eve. And as a result, they became a genetically modified organism, subject to sin and its consequences, and marred the image of God in them forever. But you know what? The forever, thank God, Jesus came to this world. And the plan of salvation was introduced to reverse all of this. But while we are here on this world, we need to be aware of what it takes. What does it take to become organic again? What does it take to become organic? We have to look out for these things. The serpent. The insect. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times there shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. See, introducing things, mixing things, mixing things. Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrines which we have learned. And do what? Avoid them. You see, friends, we cannot go and attend error-teaching churches. We cannot be on television and radio and listen to error-teaching sermons. We cannot make it part of our reading library, error-filled books. We cannot attend those places where error is taught and not expect to become, what? Contaminated to some degree, depending on what principle? Cross-contamination and the power of influence. It cannot happen. You see, this is what happens when they spray. You know, when they spray, there's a whole other study on this the drift of herbicides and pesticides. How far do they drift from where they, uh, where they, you know, where they put them out? How far do they drift from here? Look at this drift. Things drift. You see, what were some of the verses that we read earlier? What were the verses we read? Can things be equally yoked together? Can we have communion? Can we have fellowship? Can we have proximity? 
I would like to suggest, friends, we need to run far from error and heresy. We cannot have a proximity to it and feel safe and comfortable. I'm sorry. I don't see that concept or that principle anywhere in Scripture. And I want to share with you this. The Bible teaches in the world, but not of the world. And I'll tell you, that Scripture text is not always understood and taught clearly by everyone. Because not everyone understands what the Bible teaches that means or looks like. What does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to park ourselves up on a mountain and isolate ourselves from human beings? No, it doesn't mean that. But it doesn't mean also what many people interpret it and reflect it and express it in their own lives. If the world is our friend, then God is our enemy. Now, if we love God, we will love other human beings. We'll reach out to them. We'll serve them. We'll minister to them. We'll introduce them to the plan of salvation, which brings them back again to the original state. But we have to become careful, and we need to be aware of the fact that we can become contaminated. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the scriptures and the advice in God's word. Come out from among them and be ye. There is one body, one spirit. Even ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You see, there is only one truth. There's only one Bible. There's only one way that we can be saved. There's only one way, and that's through who? Through Jesus Christ. And His whole purpose for us in this world and for living is to restore us back to that. That's what it's all about. We'll have one more verse and then we'll close our study. We'll continue on the subject at other times, opportunity for it. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If we're not abiding in Christ, if we don't have the doctrine of Christ, we don't have the Father. We don't have the Son. This is my verse. This is Psalm 119. This is the biggest chapter in the Bible. 176 some verses. It talks about God's word and God's word. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth. It's my desire that for each of us, this statement is true. That God's word is the bread we feed. God's pure, unadulterated, unmodified word is that we cherish and we value. And all others we shun and ensure that we do not have this cross-contaminated by the things of this world. You know, there's a danger. There's a danger for God's plan not to work in your and my life. And that comes only when we do not follow and heed the principles of what it takes to become or to be an organic Christian. May God help each and every one of us to this end. Is my wish. Amen. Amen.